The Descent. This is the descent of Persephone into Pluto's territory, Hades, the underworld. These are the shadows which come forth through relationships, which one must face to create perhaps the strongest marriage of the entire Greek pantheon. Persephone is the daughter of Demeter. Demeter is the great mother. She is the earth who bears the fruits and nourishes the people. Persephone, instead of being given a name, is described in the Homeric hymns as the slim-ankled daughter of Demeter. One day, this slim-ankled daughter is in the field picking flowers with her friends when she sees the most beautiful Narcissus's flower. Upon picking it for her bouquet, the ground splits under her feet. It was a trap, and she is abducted by Hades, the ruler of the underworld. What is the meaning of the Narcissus's flower? Narcissus saw his reflection in a pond, fell in love with it, and wasted away in his inability to leave his new love, unaware it was his own reflection, and died staring into the water. The Narcissus then grew from his decomposed body. This is a death and a rebirth process. Kali, a Hindu goddess characteristic of the demonic, destructive, and death-inducing field of the underworld, is married to Shiva, a god of transformation. The myth says that everyone in the three worlds is scared of Kali in her wildest, tongue-split, bloody form and ask Shiva to calm her down. Shiva's her husband, and he laughs at her. She asks why, and he tells her that she might think she looks beautiful, but she is hideous and must look at herself. It is quite ridiculous. She goes to the river and sees herself in the reflection. She realizes that Shiva is right. She bathes herself in the water, the darkness is removed, and she emerges golden. This is a process in alchemy called salutio, transformation by water. She is baptized by the water. It is an emotional release which cleanses and purifies. She dissolves into the water of the anima mundi and the prima materia is transformed. Gold, in alchemy, represents the daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N, the essence of oneself, and in that, the essence of God. This is the gold of our sun, our piece of the transpersonal fire. Kali faces and sheds her darkness. This is how she emerges golden. She has found her gold. She has found her essence. The Narcissus's flower is an omen that Persephone will have to look into her own reflection in her journey of descent. What lives in the underworld? In Hades, there lives the most primordial and bloody creatures, the Furies, Nyx, and even Chaos herself. In Hades lives our demons. This is our animal body, the monster, the impulsive reaction to the environment, and the deepest part of our psychic life. Some argue that the demons are the daimon. Through descent and death, we find the daimon, the missing part, the essence of unity that was repressed by classification as bad or shameful, the hidden treasure buried underground. This is seeing the shadow and coming into wholeness, unity, integration, and individuation. It is the work of finding alchemical gold, our sun, our essence, finding the albedo and covering it in blood, the philosopher's stone. It is said that the dragon's head contains the jewel of enlightenment. The hero cannot kill the dragon because upon realizing the incoming death, the dragon will then destroy the jewel. This is the dragon's animal instinct, which is based in fear. Instead, the hero must lull the dragon to sleep, put its defenses down, and then retrieve the jewel. Psychologically, this illustrates how we must nurture the scary parts of ourselves. We must accept those parts we wish to destroy. For example, 
If you are possessive, recognizing this instinct which needs to gain power over the other, accepting this part of yourself and finding the jewel inside of it, this does not mean that we act as the possessive dragon, instead we find the gold within. In astrology, Pluto derives from the word in uh, Latin Plutonus, meaning riches and jewels. To merge with Pluto is to find the jewels hidden underground in Hades. Pluto, if you look in the sky, is the farthest planet from us. It is the one that is the hardest for us to see. The underworld represents the unconscious. Here we learn to recognize the most primal and animalistic parts of the psyche. In Pluto, we begin to recognize what Edward F. Edinger called the Dionysic, Dionysic element of moisture in his book, The Anatomy of the Psyche. Edinger relates Dionysus to the Salutio process in alchemy. Salutio is the alchemical cleansing by water, which we discussed, and Pluto is a water planet. In the stories, water is where Dionysus from the Dionysic element comes from and where he returns to. Water being where we all come from, such as illustrated in many mythologies, as well as in the birthing process itself. You know, I could not help but recognize that Dionysus' followers, the Minids, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, you know, they're the wild women with, that worship him and with every man they come across, they either want to copulate with him or kill him. <laughs> well, you know, they have two instincts, sex and death. They are embodiments of Freud's most basic impulses. You see, Freud was an inherently biological thinker, and he recognized that there are two impulses which we have been performing since we were simple cells. Since we were cells, life was cells, and these two impulses were to die and to create more, death and procreation. He classified these instincts as the most basic instincts of nature itself, and therefore, humans, we are nature embodied. So these are the most basic drives on an evolutionary level. Dionysus represents the water of life, and the Minids are our feminine animal nature, right? The earth, life is feminine, right? Uh, this is the deepest part of us working throughout our, our evolution, our most instinctual no nature. And another play of Dionysus embodiments of Freud's two most fundamental and rudimentary instincts, rudimentary, <laughs> rudimentary instincts, are in Dionysus's birth story. And a birth story can be seen as an omen of what one's life will be. Dionysus was dismembered upon his birth. Therefore, in, in his birth, omen, he faced a death and a rebirth, Thanatos and Eros. In fact, in the Orphic text, they recognize Dionysus as the son of Persephone, a prince of the underworld. The underworld holds the parts of ourselves that we can't see because we've made them unconscious. So we project them onto other people. We see ourselves in the reflection you see your shadow in the reflection of the relationship. Every time something in a relationship makes you very angry, this is a red dinging light to you. There is something here that you are not at peace with in yourself. You know, maybe it's your mom and she caused the issues and maybe your boyfriend has lied to you and maybe they deserve the anger. Maybe they don't. Either way, this is an emotional trigger and should alert you that you have a demon here. This is your shadow. So what is the difference between Narcissus and Kali? Narcissus didn't realize it was his reflection. Therefore, he could only be cleansed in literal death, falling into the water, salutio, dissolving the ego, a descent into water. This is Scorpio's water, the water of Hades or Pluto, the water we drown in. Whereas Kali could look into the same water, the reflection, and recognize herself. Psychologically speaking, this is recognizing our own projections onto others in the reflections of relationships. A narcissist 
never recognizes his or her own flaws, only projects them onto the other. And this prevents the narcissist from growing or changing, which requires death and rebirth. In the physical world, our relationships with others reflect our relationships with ourselves. Kali could see this, and she could cleanse herself through recognizing herself in the reflection. So what does it mean to descend into the underworld for the individual? Quote, Inherent in the Dionysic element of moisture is not only the power which maintains life, but also the power which creates it. This flows through the entire human and animal world as a fertilizing, generative substance. Auto Dionysus, Myth and Cult, page 164. If we become static, if we get comfortable, if things don't change, this is death. The power which creates life is movement, is transformation, is evolution. To stay at a single point is to die. Alan Oaken, a wonderful astrologist, always says, when one meets Pluto, quote, transform or die, <laughs> end quote. This is also why those things we feel the most shame for are those things that when integrated are meant to empower us the most. Yes, I am rageful but I will not be taken advantage of. In recognizing that I have rage, I will not be blindsided by it, and I am able to recognize my own power within that. I take responsibility for myself and seek to control my impulses. This is a transformation. I take the power of the rage for myself rather than the rage taking power over me. A coyote is not bad for killing. It is the nature of the coyote. You are not bad for having rage, but you are not an animal, and you have the power to sublimate your instincts. This is the next step in the alchemical process. This is the rebirth. Sublimation is the alchemical process by air, where either a solid rises up to become a gaseous substance or is hammered into something so tiny and refined it is the consistency of air. Jesus' resurrection. This is a rebirth where he is transformed from physical into air. Sublimatio. Um, his spirit rises above the physical. Air Air is what connects us to the gods, right? You burn a fire, you make a sacrifice, and when it's burned up, it goes into the air. It, it ascends to the gods. In air, one rises above the animal instinct and is able to look objectively at the issues and make decisions from a rational place. This is consciousness, and this is evolution. Accepting rather than denying or repressing the darker, hidden, taboo, shameful impulses brings wisdom and knowledge, a non-personal truth, and an objective view. You're not blindsided by the darker side. This way, when it comes up, you recognize it, you accept it, you nurture it without acting in unconscious, animalistic ways. You say, hey, this makes me feel really sad and cry. You know, this doesn't mean you act from that place. It's about feeling it and waiting for it to calm down. Then you can sublimate it. You know, ask yourself, why did this anger me so much? What button did it hit? Why did this happen? Was the other person acting from their unconscious place, from their childhood wounds? You gain a larger perspective, a more objective perspective, and act from there. This is what it means to integrate the monster, to find the jewel, and to emerge golden. You integrate the monster by accepting your needs, even those you're ashamed of, and finding a way that these needs can be met through the sublimation. If you don't find a way the needs can be met through a process of objectivity and analysis, they're going to find another way to be met. This means the monster will emerge and in infantile, animalistic, and unconscious ways demand the needs be met. This monster represents the unconscious impulses C.G. Jung talks about emerging upon the repression of our instincts and our emotions. Animals 
only live in the now, whereas consciousness, awareness, and objectivity knows the Lord of time and can act in a way which incorporates a view of the larger picture. Yet, knowledge and air sublimation holds a temptation inside of it um, to immediately sublimate or immediately rise above the issue. When dealing with a monster, you cannot skip the step of integration. You cannot skip nurturing your own wounds and recognizing your emotions and your needs, even if they are, quote, wrong or shameful. To ignore them, to not feel them, to not recognize or nurture them, this would be to repress them. And this is what creates the monster. C.G. Jung demonstrated that to repress only means the instinct will come out in an unconscious way, in our unconscious actions. It will make a backdoor entrance. Therefore, we must consciously love the animal and the monster inside of us. It is not bad, and we are not bad. This is why I urge you, don't label something is bad. Well, I'm not supposed to feel jealous right now. Well, I'm not supposed to be mad at this. But you are. So let yourself be mad. It doesn't mean that you need to literally get mad at this other person, but let yourself feel that. And after you've nurtured the emotion, then ask why? Where did this come from? You know, solve the mystery. Pluto, the underworld, is also a place where you you try to get to the bottom of things. You, you solve the mystery. The Narcissus's flower blooms many flowers on a single stem. Here's my own. I think this is speaking to an aspect of what we find in the underworld. A polytheistic, not monotheistic, consciousness. We can be both good and bad at once. Actually, good and bad are useless terms. It's more like we are both positive and negative like a magnet. The moral judgment does not apply. The point is, we do not need to simply be a single god which is all good. Polytheistic religions such as Greek, Hindu, Norse, Shinto, and Egyptian mythologies have many gods. This speaks to looking at an individual and instead of simplifying her or him, realizing that their consciousness is a complex manifestation of an entire archetypal pantheon. One contains both the instincts of Mars and war and Aphrodite's love and harmony. When we go to the underworld, we see those aspects of consciousness that would easily be simply classified as bad. We see the areas which are taboo, which we are ashamed of. And if we want to re-emerge, we must recognize them as our own and even become empowered by them. Individuals are not good or bad, dark or light, feminine or masculine. Instead, they have an amalgamation of all of it inside a single consciousness. The different buds speak to the descent illuminating your many flowers, many gods, many gifts, and many potentials. You are many things. Trying to simplify yourself, you cut part of yourself off. When you descend into the underworld, find those hidden, shameful parts of yourself that you classified bad and threw away. Your job is to integrate them. Once you do this, you emerge golden, like Kali, or like Persephone does, as a queen. Back to the story. Demeter cries for her daughter and wanders the earth in misery. Eventually, because Demeter has stricken famine on the earth, and none of the vegetables, crops, fruits, flowers are growing, the gods must intervene. And they make a deal with her that if she will bring back the crops, they will let her see Persephone. Yet, before Persephone leaves the underworld, she eats a sweet pomegranate seed. When you eat the fruit of the underworld, you are bound to it. This happens in many mythologies. Specifically, I'm thinking of Izunami and Izunami in the Shinto creation mythology, or the one that I'm about to talk about. And this eating of the, the fruit is why today Persephone descends into the underworld for one third of the year and returns in the spring. 
This is when Demeter, the earth, restores life. This story rings eerily similar to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, the earth, is the nourishing mother. This is Demeter in the Christian mythos. In the garden, Eve is seduced by the snake to eat the apple, and this then forces her out of the garden, out of the nourishing arms of the mother, to find self-realization, to be aware, to be conscious. You must have good and evil. You must have the heavenly and the hell-like. Both Eve and Persephone take the fruit. They are seduced by Hades, the devil, the snake, because they don't want to be in the, their mother's arms anymore. Persephone had been living in the image of her mother, helping with her mother's work. When she descends, she is forced to detach from her mother, from her protector. She must see who she is without anyone else's help. She descends as the slim-ankled daughter and reemerges as Queen Persephone. Both Eve and Persephone want to see their reflection, the good and the bad. They want to individuate and self-actualize. They must leave home and safety to descend into chaos, meet their demons, and come back individuated, bejeweled, and empowered. They choose adventure over safety. But this is not the hero's adventure into the world. This is the woman's adventure into herself into her own nature, into who she is. This is the spiral inwards to one's own core. This is what Pluto, Scorpio, and the eighth house are all about. The archetypal experience asks for a complete transmutation in order to find the alchemical gold. It asks you to look at those things which you project onto others, those things that make you the most uncomfortable in yourself, it wants you to recognize these parts of yourself, even if they seem wrong, and stop projecting your needs for acceptance onto those around you. The scorpion wants you to take the time to see where in relationship you have emotional triggers. Where and who are you asking to be the, the nurturing mother to take care of you? Where do you need to take responsibility for yourself? This is the calling for your own descent. This is Persephone's journey. Didn't you know? The scorpion takes you on a feminine journey into yourself. Now, quick story time. I call this story My Boyfriend, the Luciferian Snake. This is not our love story. This is my love story. How through his reflection, I fell in love with myself. He would have a different love story with the same result. To fall in love with the self, it takes facing the demons and the chaos that live at the very bottom of the psyche. This is why he is my snake, as I am most likely his. The further we came to know each other, the closer the demons became. Through my demons, he saw his own, and through his demons, I saw mine. We met each other's demons. We were admonished by each other's demons, even betrayed by each other's demons. But instead of rejecting one another for them, we grew up together by facing these demons and healing the wounds left in their path of destruction. 